Well, man, welcome to the Robert H. Jackson Center in Chautauqua County, New York. Thank you. It's great to be here. I have a major league question here. Brett Favre, do you still like him? Uh, it depends. Has there been any news that's come out yet nope. today? Okay. I, you know, this is a complicated question. I don't want to take too much time on it, but well, I'll, it's, it's, I'll, I'll give you the, the short answer, which is unless until he plays a game for the Vikings, I'm totally with him. I thought the Packers mishandled things. I was rooting for him last year. But if he shows up on the Vikings, it's a, you know, the, 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 manif the, the physical manifestation that turns on this is, you know, I was trying to figure out a way to deal with the fact that, all right, I was on his side of his dispute with the Packers, um, but, you know, I don't want to be a Jets fan. I mean, can't be a Jets fan. So the, the best game that Favre played for the Jets last year happened to be the day they were wearing the throwback jerseys. Mm -hmm. So he was wearing a New York Titans jersey when he threw six touchdown passes. So I found, on the, you know, the wonders of the Internet, I found a Brett Favre uh, New York Titans jersey, uh, which I've purchased and have proudly worn. But if he ends up playing a game for the Vikings, it's physically in the trash. So there you go. There's the answer to the Favre question. I love it. Um, there was a quote from a guy named Evan Tager, um, Mayor Brown, who said, Paul Clement is the holy grail of law firm recruiting. The buzz in the legal world about Clement is like the buzz in basketball when LeBron James was coming out of high school and turning pro. It'll be interesting to see where the market will go. Why would somebody write that about you? I, I have no idea, but it, it reminds me I need to... Uh Need to send Evan like a thank you notice because that was that was very good press, <laughs> um, I have to say because that was at a point when uh, I had not yet settled on a law firm and I I, I don't think that quote hurt, um, so uh, so but you know what possessed Evan to say it you'd really need to need to ask Evan but uh, I was certainly flattered by it and uh, you know it, it probably is it, it's it's attributed to the Solicitor General's office and uh, this was probably. Uh, not true in, uh, in, in, in Jackson's day, but uh, certainly at this point, I think that uh, people who have the incredible opportunity to serve as Solicitor General, um, you know, definitely do have a, a leg up on re-entry into private practice because, uh, you know, the opportunity to argue cases in the Supreme Court um, is a pretty rare one. Right. Um, if you're in private practice, as I was before I was in the SG's office, trying to uh, make your way as an appellate lawyer, it's, uh, it's very hard to get that first Supreme Court argument because uh, most clients' question is, well, how many times have you done this before? Um, and zero is not the answer they're looking for. Right. Um, so to get an opportunity to serve in the SG's office, um, you know, definitely makes you a little more marketable in the private sector. Um, and I think it's interesting because, you know, I do think uh, that the Solicitor General's job um, in that respect is probably a better job than the Attorney General's job mm -hmm. um, because the Solicitor General is off doing something that has a direct analog uh, in you know private law firms uh, the Attorney General not so much um, and the Solicitor General because he's so focused on you know the law and litigating specific cases also tends to avoid some of the you know the the shoals that uh, that await uh, an attorney general um, in Jackson's day or in the modern day. So, let's treat this as an informational tape for a second. Describe what a solicitor general does. Well, a solicitor general, I mean, does a whole lot of things, but the most obvious thing that the solicitor general does is argue cases on behalf of the United States, principally the executive branch of the United States and the Supreme Court of the United States, and so. You know, if people know one thing about the Solicitor General, that's what they know. Um, you know, more sort of kind of definitionally, the Solicitor General is the person who is essentially responsible for directing the litigation of the United States, um, certainly in the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. Um, you know, the Solicitor General on the org chart is below the Attorney General, so if the Attorney General wanted to direct the position of the United States, would take in a piece of litigation that's the attorney general's right but as a practical matter the attorney general's pretty removed from that kind of you know day-to-day -day decision making in, in individual cases and so the solicitor general really does have this broad responsibility for the litigation of the united states and so you know for every day the solicitor general's in court arguing a case in the supreme court uh... there's a tremendous work by the solicitor general and the rest of the office deciding whether to appeal uh, you know, a single case, you know, a prosecution of a single individual, there's a motion to suppress um, that uh, is granted by a district court judge. In order to take that to the Court of Appeals, uh, you need the SG's approval. 
And so there's an awful lot of work that goes into deciding which cases the United States is going to take to the next level up the appellate ladder. Uh, there's also an awful lot of work that goes into just the briefing of cases in the Supreme Court. So the, uh, the arguing in front of the Supreme Court is definitely the, the, the highlight. It's probably what attracts most people to the office, but it's kind of a tip of an iceberg, and the rest of the iceberg is every bit as important, but a lot less glamorous. As you graduated from law school and, and did a couple of incredible clerk opportunities, one of them being with Justice Anthony Scalia, what's the process there? How, how, did, how did you apply for that job and get selected? Well, it's, uh, I, you know, I guess it's, 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 there's no great mystery to the process in the sense that it changes from year to year, especially at the Court of Appeals level. They try, to, uh, they try to reform the process every couple of years one way or another. But, you know, in my day, you applied to Court of Appeals clerkships basically in your second year of law school. Um, so they were basically hiring you on your first year grades, which was not a lot of information. But um, I was fortunate to get hired by, uh, by Judge Silberman on the D.C. Circuit. Um, and, uh, you know, he was a judge who sort of, you know, perceived as being a feeder judge, somebody who would send a lot of his law clerks on to the, the Supreme Court. So that was part of the, I mean, he's a phenomenally interesting person who'd done all sorts of things, including served as ambassador to Yugoslavia and the like. So he's, you know, a, a great person to get a chance to clerk for, but he was somebody, you know, he wanted to clerk for. Uh, in addition to his many great attribute, attributes, but because he was also uh, something of a feeder judge, mm -hmm. and uh, and then I, you know, I was relatively fortunate. And again, this changes from kind of time and you know time to time and shifts a little bit. I mean, I I, I was hired by Justice Scalia um, in the beginning of my last semester of law school, so I had the the, the clerkship with Justice Scalia lined up. Um, you know, but you know. Bef and I had four months of law school after that, so uh, that was a great, you know, fortunate position to be in. In both cases, you, you sort of, you know, send an application letter, and you get selected if you're lucky for an interview, and then you get very nervous for an interview. Um, and uh, and if things go reasonably well, uh, then uh, then you get an offer. So, what was the shocking question of Scalia to you? Oh, you know, I'm not sure that there was, you know, a particularly shocking question. I do remember though that. Uh, you know, you know, feeling like you know it was not the best interview I'd ever had in my life, um, and uh, you know we'd gotten involved in uh, in some discussion of some point of antitrust law, and I I definitely had the feeling I had not persuaded him uh, that I had the better point of view on some issue, but uh, I guess I survived the process. So, but it was a very substantive interview. Yeah, it was reasonably substantive, probably about a half an hour, and it was probably, I'd say about half and half, about substance, and then just trying to get a feel for you as a person. And on the substance, he didn't really care what he was, it, you know, it wasn't like there was a right answer. I think he was just getting a sense of whether you were somebody who could uh, kind of, you know, handle difficult legal interaction with him on an ongoing basis. One of the great things, you know, clerkships are different for different justices. One of the great things, in my view, about a Scalia clerkship is that it was a very oral clerkship. And you look at the Blackman papers, and I was actually, I clerked the last year that Justice Blackman was on, on the court. So, um, so, you know, I had a flavor of the Jackson clerkship, both from talking to uh, the clerks from my year who were there. And then you look at the Blackman papers, um, and it's like, you know, there was, there was hardly a thought in that chambers that wasn't written down. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the Scalia papers, which presumably will not be released until, you know, Whatever, whatever the rule of perpetuities is, you know, you know, you know, you know, twelve babies born in New York City on the on the day that Justice Scalia perishes, and then you know, seven years later or something. Um, no, but you know, the the Scalia papers won't be with us for a long, long time, I imagine. But I think they're also going to be much less illuminating, because it's a very oral uh, chambers. Um, you know, instead, you know, most justices wanted a big long bench memo, and most he wanted a page, maybe. I mean, so it was a everything happened orally. So I think in the interview he wanted to. Make sure you're somebody who would who would thrive in that in that environment. And did you? Well, I like to think so. You know, again, you're asking the wrong person. You have to ask him. I mean, I, I I enjoyed the heck out of it, and uh, um, it was a wonderful year. And I think it's a great it's a great preparation uh, for the rest of your legal career. One of the one of the things that I, I you know I had this very early when I was practicing law as a young associate. You know, I was in with some big general counsel and um, talking about some point of law and. Uh, you know, this general counsel is probably responsible for millions of dollars of business for the law firm, and I was a third-year associate. And you know, there's one point of law though that was kind of critical to the discussion, where the client seemed to me was just dead wrong 
And so at some point, you know, in a relatively diplomatic and polite way, I sort of, you know, explained how, you know, respectfully I had sort of a different take on the issue and, you know, you might want to look at it this way and that way and in the process basically offered my opinion that the, the, the client was dead wrong. And I walked out of there thinking, now why in the world did you think, you know, did you have the gumption to even do that? And it occurred to me, I think it was because, you know, once you've had, once you've told Justice Scalia in chambers that you think he's wrong on something mm -hmm. um, and had the opportunity to interact with him and go back and forth and back and forth, um, there's not a lot in the law that's going to intimidate you as an experience. Right. Um, you've already had one of the sort of, you know, great intimidating experiences um, in the law. So I think it was a great thing to essentially have under your belt at, you know, age 27 or whatever it was. You became, through Kirkland and Ellis, King and Spaulding, the youngest, ultimately the youngest member to be part of the as Solicitor General. And I think, I don't know if you were the youngest or were... Uh, goes back to William Howard Taft. I'm not sure that. Yeah, there there are a couple who are younger, but is certainly the youngest in a, in about 50 years. And you know, I think I I figured out a way to say it where if I was the youngest confirmed by the Senate since Taft. There you go. There you go. Because there was one guy, uh, that future Judge Cummings was uh, was younger than me, but he was a recess appointed mm -hmm. appointment uh, at the end of the Truman administration. But it, yeah, no, it was a great honor to to have you know a job that I think for. For a lot of people, is a is is a pinnacle job, and I'm sure it will be a pinnacle job for me. But to to have it at an early stage in the career is a is a great fortune. Going from King and Spaulding into the Justice Department was that just a, a, an easy leap from you to go from private to public? Do they encourage that? Is that sort of yeah? No, it, I mean the, the, the firm certainly encouraged it. I mean this is you know this is Judge Bell's Judge Griffin Bell's law firm. So um, you know he had gone back and forth between the public sector and and private practice, and so the firm certainly was encouraging of it. And, uh, you know, I had, in a sense, already done sort of a mini version of this. I'd started my career at Kirkland and Ellis in private practice, gone to work in the Senate for a couple of years on the Senate Judiciary Committee, and then going back to King and Spaulding. So, you know, I'd had a little bit of uh, this, this flavor for the back and forth. And, uh, and then, you know, having clerked on the court and, you know, followed the court, you know, ever since I'd I'd clerked, and the year I clerked, sort of, you know, became very familiar with the Solicitor General's office and the quality of its uh, of their work. I mean, it certainly, you know, I came into it. It certainly had a learning curve and all of that, but you know, I did come in, you know, you know I think pretty far down the line in terms of understanding the work of the office and having a great deal of respect for the work of the office and the lawyers in the office. As Solicitor General, what does Robert H. Jackson mean to? What did that mean to you at the time, if, if, if anything? Was, it, was, he a, was that a presence? Well, sure. I mean, it's physically a presence, at least for most of the time I was there, and that his portrait um, hanged in, hung in the uh, SG's office. Um, and, you know, and it actually hung in the uh, sort of the external formal part of the office over the fireplace. So it had, uh, it had pride of place. Um, and, you know, there, there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, I think one is that, uh, you know, there are only so many solicitors general who went on to become attorney general, and it would be natural uh, in the SG's office to have somebody who went and, and on and did that because, uh, you know, you, you have portraits of attorneys general, not, there are no formal portraits, painted portraits of solicitors general. Um, if there were, I mean, Jackson's portrait would be there too. But I'm just saying this sort of limits the universe of potential people for whom it would make a great deal of sense to have their portrait uh, hanging in uh, in the SG's office. But uh, but there there were other candidates, Francis Biddle, for for example. Um, now Jackson has two advantages over over Biddle. One, he certainly was a, a more handsome man. Um, so you know, to the extent that <laughs> aesthetics matter here, uh, you know, the, I checked out the Biddle portrait and. Uh, I wasn't I wasn't that excited about it, um, but I mean, there's also the, the the much more serious and obvious point that you know Jackson's reputation as solicitor general, as attorney general, as a justice, as the Nuremberg prosecutor. I mean, all of that together makes him you know I think an inspiration for um, you know all sorts of lawyers in the department, and not the least of which um, in the SG's office. And not only does his attorney general portrait hang or hung for most of the time uh, I was there, uh, as I was uh, mentioning, uh, you know, I, I lost him at the end of uh, my service to uh, Attorney General McKaysey, and it's hard to de deny an Attorney General from New York, uh, an Attorney General from New York's uh, portrait, but uh, 
But in addition to his attorney general portrait, um, there are photographic uh, portraits of all the solicitors general. Um, and his portrait there hangs in a place of honor in the SG's conference room, along with the, uh, I think, three other solicitors general who went on to serve as justices of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, kind of any way you look at it, whether as an advocate, um, or as uh, as a justice, I mean, there's there's sort of obvious reasons why uh, Justice Jackson is held in such high regard uh, by the lawyers in the SG's office. You argued almost 50 cases before the Supreme Court. At one point, there was case number one. What did you feel like? Uh, incredibly, incredibly nervous, um, and. You know, I did feel like, I mean, I guess, you know, just to sort of, man, you know, sort of illustrate how nervous I was, um, you know, I made a point of having my parents come to that first argument, and some people are like, well, isn't it going to make you, you know, more nervous having your parents there? And I sort of said, no, I actually thought this was ideal, because there's no way I could be more nervous. Um, <laughs> so you might as well just pile it all on um, and, uh, and just, you know, put it all on the table. Um, you know, it was, it was an incredibly... Um, nerve-wracking experience. I mean, you know, I, I have to say, like, although I was very nervous, you know, I did have some, I mean, you know, having, having been a law clerk up there, I think was a great help. I mean, I'd seen a bunch of arguments. I'd seen some go very well. I'd seen some go very poorly. You know, I'd hoped I'd at least get somewhere in the middle there. Um, but, you know, you did have a sense, I think, from clerking that you knew essentially what the justices were looking for in argument. Um, and it had the good fortune, in, you know, at various times in my career to work with lawyers where I was helping them prepare for their own Supreme Court arguments. So, you know, I felt like compared to a lot of people on their maiden argument, I had a lot of advantages. I also thought to myself that I had a huge advantage that I was cognizant at the time of, um, which was that most advocates don't have in their first argument, which was I was almost certain I'd have a second argument. I mean, you know, just taking this job in the SG's office where, you know, even if I sort of blew it, um, you know, I pretty much have to have a second argument. Um, and, you know, if you're arguing a case in private practice, you don't really have that assurance. You know, it may well be your only shot, and if you don't do particularly well, it probably will be your only shot. Um, so I have to say it was, it was a great comfort to me to know um, that, uh, you know, sort of, you know, win, lose, or draw, um, you know, I'd be back there. First question from Scalia. Did, did you kind of wonder, nice, buddy? Oh, no, and I mean, you know, from that very first case and, and since then on a number of occasions, you know, I, I, you know, I've, the idea I've been asked, you know, do you think Justice Scalia was uh, ever sort of cut you a little more slack because you, you clerked for him? And I've often thought that if anything, it cut the other way. <laughs> um, so, you know, he, he had... Uh, you know, he had some tough questions for me in, the, in, in my first case. My first case was one where he ultimately, you know, voted on my side. So uh, he, didn't, he didn't beat me up too bad. Um, and uh, I was too busy to, you know, in the moment to, uh, to, uh, to kind of notice one way or another. But I'm told by others who were there that he seemed at various points to be smiling with some avuncular pride. So, When you get done with, with the argument and your light goes on and you, you sit down, do you have a sense of whether this was a persuasive argument or not? I mean, do you handicap when you get done? No, never in any sort of formal way. I mean, you know, the percentages are not something that uh, I think most lawyers, at least litigators, want to engage in. Um, but you definitely have a sense of whether it went well. Um, you know, in, 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 in all honesty, I think, you know, your, your sense has less to do with how you thought you did than more how the court reacted. Because typically you've been working on these cases. Through the questioning. Exactly, through the questioning. Because... Typically, in these cases, you put a lot of work and effort into the case before you walk up to the podium. Um, and I certainly had cases that I thought would be tough cases that ended up not being nearly as tough as I thought they would be. Um, I certainly had cases that were every bit as tough as I, as I thought mm -hmm. they would be. Um, and, you know, if you had the, the, the good fortune to have the number of opportunities to argue cases that I had, I mean, one real advantage is, you know, over time, you still get surprised but you get surprised a little bit less. And, you know, there's a, there's a great discipline that comes from knowing, working on a case where you know ultimately that you're going to lose. I mean, you know, you sort of, you know, the, 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 the first time you do it, it's very frustrating. Uh, you know, if it happens again, you know, it, you never like losing. But you do, you know, there, there's a discipline with comes with really like working through a case and realizing, you know, there's, I'm going to try my best, but I'm just not sure there's a way 
to get five votes in this case. Um, but I think that's a great discipline for future cases because um, you know you can go in and hopefully you can get to a position where you're not uh, facing that same dynamic and you really feel like okay now I know it. This is this is a case where I got a great chance to to get to five or beyond. There's a mention here in the Wikipedia that said uh, uh, Paul Clement had been mentioned as a possible Supreme Court candidate in the John McCain presidency. No need to comment on that particular thing other than with Sotomayor uh, uh, president or, uh, nomination, the question really comes as to whether you really do need the, the judicial experience as a condition precedent to becoming a Supreme Court justice. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I, you know, I do think, um, you know, obviously, you know, to have something like, you know, Judge Sotomayor with all this vast experience is, is clearly an asset. Um, but... Um, you know, I, I mean, not for my own case, but just generally, I don't think that's by any means a prerequisite to being a successful uh, Supreme Court justice. And of course, if, when we're going to start picking examples, one uh, I, I think could pick Justice Jackson and 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 pretty much win the argument with that point. I mean, I'm not sure anybody's going to take you on on saying that. They might say, well, that was then, and things are different. They might say, well, you know, that's the exception that proves the rule. But I think they'd have to have to concede that point. And, you know, I think if you look at somebody like uh, Ch the, the current Chief Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, um, you know, there are people who, you know, uh, you know, love his jurisprudence. There are people that are less fond of it. I don't think anybody thinks that he's not an incredibly capable jurist. And I don't think there's anybody who's thought about it too long and hard that thinks that, you know, he would have been any less qualified to be on the federal bench uh, if he hadn't served for what was it, you know, three years on the D.C. Circuit. I mean, so, so I think that's another kind of modern example of why, you know, judicial service is an obvious um, qualification, an obvious thing that you would look for. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 it's never something that, you know, you'd have two people, exact same resume, and one's had judicial service, the other hasn't. I think you'd always prefer the person with judicial service. But to think that it's uh, an absolute prerequisite, I think, probably would be a mistake. Um, and you know, again, there, so, you know, it's if 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 you, as as just you know, Chief Justice Roberts did, for example, or Justice Jackson did, if you've had the argument, the discipline of arguing cases in the Supreme Court, I think that you know puts you, uh, you know, sort of in a different group from you know somebody. I, you know, I do think to take somebody who you know had never argued a case in the Supreme Court, never been a judge, you know, served you know only as um, a governor for example, um, as some of the candidates that have been talked about. Um, you know, I think they could be very successful. I think that's a tougher transition now than at the time, say, that Justice Jackson was on the court. And part of it is, um, you know, there was a fair amount of diversity on the court in his day. You know, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting question to me because you can look at the fact that whoever President Obama appointed for this position, um, if he appointed somebody who wasn't a court of appeals judge, um, you know, they'd, they'd be the only one who wasn't a court of appeals judge. And in the abstract, you know, it's easy to think, well, you know, a little more diversity would be a good thing. But it does put you at a certain disadvantage, I think, um, that, you know, a, a, a Hugo Black didn't have when he went on the court because there are a variety of people with different backgrounds. If, if a governor went on the court in this day and age, everybody else on the court would have had sort of this kind of shared experience. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, that, that might be kind of too far removed. I don't know. Yeah. Um, that's sort of my own, my own thought. When you're arguing these over 49 cases, uh, and you're often handed facts. I mean, these, these are the facts you're handed. Of those 49, is there one or two that may have said, gee, I think I may have made a difference in taking some facts and creating an, a new area of law which will make a difference? Something you say, pound your chest and say, yeah, I feel good about that. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I can, you know, at least sit in here and sort of identify anything quite like that. I mean, there certainly are cases where I do think that we were able to uh, change the subject a little bit or change the, front, the lens of analysis for the court in a way that, you know, sort of, you know, you know might have made a difference to the court in the final analysis. Um, there are a couple of cases that I was involved in where in my time in the government where we, you know, in our amicus briefs um, or our briefs for, for the government, um, you know, focused on the fact that uh, the case arose as a facial challenge and maybe took a case that, you know, 
had some bad facts um, and made the point that, well, you know, but this case really doesn't turn just on these, on these bad facts. It's an as-applied case. This is a facial challenge. Um, and I think in some of these cases, we maybe took a case that uh, if, if you hadn't tried to reframe the issue in that way and just sort of took it on with some bad facts, you might have ended up losing the case because we were able to sort of f change the frame on the case a little bit. Um, we were able to, I think, you know, get the court to look at the case as being, you know, beyond those particular cases, the, the facts of that case in a way that led them to, to you know, to, to decide in the, the favor of the position we were advocating. So there's kind of one set of cases where, I, you know, I'm not sure we've really kind of, you know, entered into a whole new dynamic, but I do think on the other hand, you know, it may have been a situation where the advocacy did at the end of the day matter. Yeah. Final question, what's next for you? If you're looking at crystal ball in 10 years from now, you've had such an amazing rise in the legal world, so many opportunities. No, I, 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 I've been truly blessed in the opportunities that have, that, that have come my way. And, you know, for the time being, I'm, you know, I'm very excited about uh, the opportunity to go into private practice and spend some time doing that. Um, as, you know, as, as I mentioned at the, at the outset, one of the great things about the Solicitor General's office generally is you're, 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 you're doing something in your government service that has a direct analog in the private practice of law. There's a lot of great public service that you can do in the government um, where there's no real analog. I mean, you know, it must be an amazing responsibility to be the Secretary of Defense and direct troop movements and the like, but you can't really do that in the private sector. Um, you know, uh, and so here there's this ability to um, go in and do something similar, but, you know, in, in, in a different area. And I'm, you know, really, you know, very much enjoying this challenge. And there's kind of a couple of aspects to the challenge. One is just, you know, being on the other side of some of these cases. You know, in some areas, uh, there's some built-in uh, presumptions that help the government a little bit that I, you know, became very fond of in the SG's office, like <laughs> sovereign immunity and, you know, deference. And now that I'm litigating cases in the, in, in the private practice of law, um, some of the same doctrines seem a little less well-founded to me. But, um, and, uh, but, you know, and, there, and, there, and there's, there's, there's a challenge that comes with it, too. The other thing is, at the same time there's a challenge, there is, a, uh, you know, they're, they're, I mean, most of my clients that you have in the, that I had in the government were at some level or another abstractions. You know, they were either the United States of America or they were, you know, at the EPA or whatever it was. Um, but, you know, they're not, you know, they're not real people. And I've had um, in, in my brief time in pri back in private practice the opportunity to have a couple of cases where, you know, have real flesh and blood clients who have suffered a real injustice. And, you know, there's a real kind of, you know, kind of additional uh, dimension almost to the practice of law when you're really dealing with a flesh and blood individual who suffered an injustice. So I'm, I'm, you know, very interested in that part. And then the other sort of dimension of the challenge is just building up a practice and trying to, uh, you know, I went back to my old law firm, uh, King & Spaulding, um, which is a great law firm with great traditions, but it didn't have an extant appellate practice at least national appellate practice, and so I've been in the process of building that up, and you know that's that's a challenge that you know I would have probably been better served going to business school than law school in some respects, in the challenge of building that up. But it's definitely a you know an interesting challenge and and very intriguing, and I think that's gonna these two challenges of this kind of next stage I think are gonna keep me busy at least for a decade. I love your.